உங்கள் தமிழரின் பிம்பம் உங்கள் டிவி Welcome to Crossroads. I'm your host, Parthi Khandaval. Two weeks ago, we discussed the relationship between us and the diaspora and Tamil Nadu through the lives of two young artists, Rajiv Seelan, a singer, rapper, and songwriter, and Bhavajan Kumar, a classical dancer. Today on Crossroads, we have organizing members of FETNA 2013. FETNA, or the Federation of Tamil Sangams of North America, is, having, is for the first time having their annual convention in Toronto this July 4th to July 7th. FETNA is traditionally mostly and mostly comprised of Tamils from Tamil Nadu. However, they have included Ula Tamils in many of their activities and in their conventions. Joining us in the studio for this discussion are Sumi Shan, Prashant Sri Chandra Mohan, and joining us through Skype is Vasanthan Kupaswami. Later in the program, I'll be interviewing Purnima Vijayashankar. Purnima was one of the founding engineers of Mint.com, a free online software that allows you to track all your financial accounts in one place. She will also be a featured speaker at the FETNA convention. Dear viewers, please join us in this conversation. Call us at 416-623-8100 to share your thoughts, ideas, and questions. Uh, welcome, Prashant. Welcome, Sumi, Thanks. for uh, taking the time to uh, join us in studio to discuss FETNA and its purpose. Um, so to give our viewers a better idea of this convention, you know, many of our viewers have seen a lot of uh, promotion, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, marketing for the upcoming convention, both online and in stores. Uh, so w what is the convention about? Um, I can probably take you through that. So oh. um, the FETNA Federation, so it's the Federation of uh, Tamil Sangams of North America, and it's been around for about 26 years. So um, as you mentioned, it is comprised of a lot of um, uh, Sangams from uh, Indians who are of uh, Tamil descent oh. from uh, from all across America, but there's also Ulangi Tamils or Ula Tamils Sangams there as well, and oh. it's generally been a um, a convention that's been primarily um, held in the states. Uh -huh. But um, we've got a number of uh, sangams here, uh -huh. including the um, Canadian Tamil Congress, who is also part of uh, is a part of the membership. Okay. And so they um, bid bid last year at the convention uh -huh. and um, want to host it here in in Toronto. So okay. for the first time in 26 years, uh -huh. the the federation is holding their conventions here in Toronto. So mm -hmm. it's com it's it's a celebration of Tamil culture, Tamil art, you know, just the community in itself. Like okay. we've got, we've got members of uh, who are Tamil of coming from India. Who we've got Ula Tamils here. Uh -huh. In North America, there's maybe four hundred thousand okay. Tamils. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Vasant, uh, are you uh, are you there? Yes. Can you give us an idea for our viewership? Because you, from what I understand, grew up with the organization, and uh, you know you mentioned it's it's older than yourself. So can you give Absolutely. us a historical uh, point of view about uh, Fetna? Sure. Uh, as it was just mentioned, uh, FETNA has been around for about 26 years. Uh, this is the 26th convention that's being held in Toronto this year. Uh, FETNA as an organization was founded in 1988. It was founded uh, at that time with four member Tamil Sangams that got together and decided that they wanted to start uh, what is called an umbrella organization. And what we mean by that is it comprises, it's, a, it's an organization which comprises uh, several different Tamil Sangams. And over the history of 26 years, uh, FETNA has grown from those four initial Tamil Sangams to mm. nearly 40 at this time. And what, what was the purpose behind the, its uh, convening? So the, the primary purpose was to uh, promote the Tamil language, uh, Tamil culture. And uh, the way that they were going to try to do that is by holding annual conventions each year. And uh, to the best of uh, uh, the membership's ability to pass on uh, Tamil culture and uh, the learning and the teachings from our language onto the next generation, the younger generation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and why the decision to have, you know, for the last 25 years you've been having in various cities in the United States, uh, why right. the decision to have in Toronto this year? So the, my understanding is that uh, each year different Tamil Sangams uh, sort of bid 
for uh, the opportunity to host FETNA. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, uh, the, the convention has been held for the past 25 years in the United States, but uh, for the first, this is the first year that uh, that uh, you know m uh, a member Tamil Sangam in Canada has made that bid, uh -huh. and uh, also the 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 um, the upper management of FETNA, the uh, the officers, the board uh, took the time, evaluated. Um, uh, the resources that are in FETNA, uh, that are in Toronto, and uh, made the decision that we can try to have a convention in uh, Canada for the first time in, in the history. Okay, great. Uh, Prashant, I'm curious to your thoughts about that decision. Uh, what does it say about the relationship between Canada Tamils and U.S. Tamils for to having this uh, convention that's traditionally held in the U.S. to come to Canada? That's a great question. Uh, I'm coming actually on behalf of the Canadian Tamil Alumni Association, and we're we're working collaboratively with FETNA this uh -huh. year. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very appreciative that CTC uh, reached out to us and one of our side sessions is uh, organizing a Young Professionals Night on July 5th, the Friday evening. Uh -huh. uh, and we have a lot of great speakers coming uh, about. We have Jay Vijayan coming from California, CIO of Tesla Motors, uh, Purnima Vijay Shankar, uh, who you have later on in the show, uh -huh. uh, one of the founding engineers of Mint.com, and we also have Yogananda Rathisan, who's just recently announced to also be attending our event, okay. so uh, who, who is the CEO of uh, Labara Group. Labar. So this is, I think, a unique forum to see Canadian Tamils and American Tamils coming together, especially at our event at a very uh, uh, professional networking setting, uh -huh. uh, and to just kind of cherish and uh, see where we have come together as uh, two unique communities. Uh -huh. uh, the Canadian Tamils are very concentrated, I would say, within the GTA. Uh -huh. When you look at American Tamil culture, it is kind of dispersed throughout America, uh -huh. and uh, hence the need of all these uh, sangams, uh, which kind of organically has uh, uh -huh. arisen over time. Uh -huh. So it'll be interesting to see the cultural uh, differences and the dynamics exist in, uh, at, at our event and throughout the, the convention mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Vasant, on the note, uh, you know, Prashant made on the U.S. Uh, Tamil community, uh, from my understanding, it's very uh, diverse in the sense that it's spread throughout the U.S., whereas in Canada, most of our Tamil communities generally, for the most part, concentrated in, in you know, the Scarborough-Markham corridor. Uh, Absolutely. So areas in Toronto you, you might not be familiar with. So um, yeah. how does the convention serve the Tamil community while, bec because of its spread across the U.S.? Well, so, uh, you know, the convention is... Uh, the main goal of the convention is to try to unite as many Tamils together as possible. Uh -huh. um, you, you're correct that in the United States there's large uh, geographical differences between where the convention has been held and also because uh, Tamils are sort of spread out all over the United States. Mm -hmm. um, in the past we've, we've seen that you know when a convention is being held in one specific city mm -hmm. um, most of the people who attend the, the convention are, are usually from the local area. Uh -huh. uh, for example, last year when the convention was held in Baltimore, you know, about 70% 70, 70 of the attendees were from the Northern Virginia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area. Okay. Um, but it, the convention is, uh, you know, it's serving to unite as many Tamils together as possible. And, you know, considering the fact that there's such a large Tamil diaspora, uh -huh. uh, especially from Elam in uh, in Can in uh, Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, we feel that you know the convention is going to be very very successful this okay. year. Thank you, uh, Sumi. Uh, you're one of the organizers for the business forum. Yes. Uh, just earlier, Prashant, you know, named some of the key speakers, mm -hmm. keynote speakers, very successful people in the business field. Mm -hmm. um, what is the larger purpose behind having a focus on business in this convention? Well, with 400,000 or so um, Tamil communities in North America. You know, it's a very highly successful, highly mobile, highly educated community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's, we've got our art and culture, you know, it's thousands of years old, but a lot of us have come from, from Ulam or even Tamil Nadu and have made it, you know, struggled and had challenges and stuff. 
but a lot of uh, individuals in our communities have really done well for themselves, right? Uh -huh. And this is an opportunity to showcase that. It's also an opportunity um, to kind of explore what's the next level for your business. Mm -hmm. So we, what we're trying to do um, at the Business Forum is highlight some of those successes with uh, a number of our speakers who are uh, going to be attending. Um, you know, they're going to highlight, for instance, Dr. Um, Sivalingam Sivanathan, uh -huh. a recent White House champion of change, and mm -hmm. he received that for the work that he's done in um, uh, new generation solar power energy. Okay. Right, and that he's he's an Ilam Tamil. He's you know went through the struggles and whatnot, but he's also now he's a professor, um, a physicist mm -hmm. at the University of Illinois. He uh -huh. owns, he's the founder and CEO of Epker um, uh -huh. uh, Technologies and uh -huh. uh, Svanathan Laboratories, which is an incubator. Right, okay. uh -huh. so that's one individual. Um, Jay Vijian mm -hmm. is um, from Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. He is the CIO of Tesla Motors and mm -hmm. was instrumental in. Um, the point in Tesla's um, history where it went from a uh, just a several million dollar okay. uh, gotcha. company uh -huh. to a several billion dollar company, company due to some of the stuff that he's done in, in IT. Right? All right, uh, Prashant, um, you're organizing a young professional site. For, you know, for a lot of um, young Tamils in Canada, uh, you have the ability and the fortune to be surrounded by uh, a considerable amount of Tamil culture. Right? What's the impetus for them to come out to this convention? as a young professional? I think there's a natural kind of correlation between an entrepreneurial mindset and, and the Tamil culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's demonstrated uh, globally. And uh, our, our event will help connect uh, successful entrepreneurs, emerging mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurs and professionals with those who are seasoned and who, who have uh, gone through the process and, and so forth. So. Uh, it is a unique opportunity for many American Tamils to come, uh -huh. uh, connect with a lot of uh, Canadian Tamils. Uh, the Toronto region is an IT cluster, uh -huh. and uh, that entre entrepreneurial mindset and that IT cluster will uh, hopefully kind of create uh, a lot of synergies between the two communities. Uh -huh. And how do you see the convention afterwards? Where do you see what, because presumably the convention is going to be held in the US for mm -hmm. much time. Is there going to be a legacy after this convention? Um, if I may, oh. I, I, I think that's our hope, um, oh. that this um, strengthen the ties within the Tamil communities, whether you're Ilan Tamil or Indian Tamil, regardless, oh. right? Oh. We're a North American Tamil community. Oh. And this is an opportunity for us to all connect, um, to meet each other. Mm -hmm. We have a common um, a language and a culture, mm -hmm. um, but you know we are also from you know Canada versus the United States and so mm. forth. So this this convention brings all of us together, and mm. we're hoping that moving forward, mm -hmm. it's a greater involvement in the in the federation, right? Mm. So that for the next um, convention, uh, where, where it be held, mm -hmm. um, you know we have a great contingent of uh, Canadian Tamils attending mm. the convention because it does strengthen the relationships between um, both communities, right? Okay, thank you, um, dear viewers. It's time for a short break. Please join us after these announcements. Welcome back, dear TVI viewers. Joining me in the studio are Sumi Shan, uh, Prashant Srichandra Mohan, and Vasant Kupaswamy is joining us through Skype. We're discussing the upcoming FETNA convention in Toronto that's happening this July 4th to the 7th. As always, please call us at 416-623-8100 to join our conversation, to share your thoughts and ideas. Uh, so uh, coming back to our discussion on the, on the relationship between Indian Tamils and us in the Ula Tamil diaspora, What's one thing, you know, we, 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 despite our unity and our commonalities through language, culture, religion, what is one aspect, like what's one aspect that we can learn from Indian Tamils and Indian Tamils can learn from us? What are your thoughts on that, Prashant? Um, I, I think, you know, the, to continue our culture uh, and to, to expand it globally, huh. I think with the, both communities experiencing great diasporas, uh, throughout the world, especially in North America and Europe, uh, there still has been uh, a concerted effort uh, 
within all these nation states to continue the Tamil culture, wh whether it be from the Ulam Tamil community or the Indian Tamil community. And uh, Fetna is a great example of that, of groups just coming together and uh, continuing to cherish and celebrate the, the ancient Tamil culture as uh -huh. this classical language and, and cherishing it. Uh, Basin, what, what are your thoughts on, on that question? Well, I think, you know, both communities coming together is, is going to have a lot in terms of uh, opportunities for learning. Um, of course, uh, Elam Tamils have been very, very active in, uh, uh, you know, uh, community activism and, and shedding some light on uh, some of the issues that are happening in Elam right now. And I think it's, it will be very good for, uh, you know, the Indian Tamils to sort of see what's happening there. Um, and, you know, here uh, back in the U.S., uh, many, many uh, organizations, even such as FETNA, are uh, doing its best to, you know, to always lend a supporting voice uh, to, uh, towards any issues that are ever affecting um, Tamils around the world. Mm -hmm. So I certainly think that those kind of things are going to uh, definitely be discussed more in detail when we're uh, together in Toronto, and we're all looking forward to those discussions. Uh, also joining us on the phone is Tanguvelaya. Uh, Tanguvelaya, what are your thoughts on that uh, evolving relationship between Indian Tamils and us in the Ulam diaspora? Uh, well, um, we have to uh, look back uh, a little in history, and you'll see that uh, because of the liberation uh, movement, uh, that was in that was there in uh, our homeland. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see the support from the Tamil Nadu. Uh, in fact, uh, the Tamil Nadu expected uh, Tamils living in North America. They took a very keen interest in this uh, development, mm -hmm. and they have been throughout uh, supporting our cause uh -huh. uh, because th there's a commonality. Because I think everybody uh, more than Anything else in the past, uh, today, uh, the Tamils, wherever they live, whether it's Tamil Nadu or it's in Malaysia or elsewhere, they are mm -hmm. trying to show you unity. Mm -hmm. and, Mila, uh, is there one thing that we as in the Ulam Tamils, we can learn from the Indian Tamils in the U.S. and, and in Tamil Nadu? Is there... <laughs> yeah, you know, the... Uh, you, uh, there are about 50 states in um, in U.S. and uh, all these, uh, the majority of them are from uh, Tamil Nadu. They are mostly professionals. Uh, and you can see uh, they have uh, formed uh, Tamil associations uh, in almost all the states. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the last 25 years or more, uh, this uh, FETNA has served as an umbrella organization for all the uh, individual uh, uh, associations, mm -hmm. and uh, they have for unity, and uh, they have uh, brought uh, a sense of uh, uh, Tamil consciousness in all the people, okay. and especially the youth. All right, thank you. Uh, Vasant, uh, you know, one uh, observation I made looking through the convention and previous conventions is, is the absence of religion in the FETNA and in the Tamil conventions. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is that deliberate on uh, on the exclusion of religion in the convention? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, deliberate in the sense that FETNA is a, a secular organization. Um, uh -huh. uh, and what I mean by that is uh, FETNA is not trying to promote or, uh, you know, allow for the establishment of any one specific religion in terms of uh, the activities that FETNA is a part of. Uh -huh. um, the reason for that, I think, is because uh, you know, the, the overarching goal of FETNA is to promote the Tamil language and the culture that comes with it, and okay. not specifically in any one specific religion. Okay. Um, okay. You know, Tamils uh, comprise of, you know, several, all, all uh, types of religions, all of the different uh, religions in the world, um, yet the one thing that we are all united by is, uh, is by that language, and that's what FETNA is trying to do, uh, not try to unite us through any one specific religion, but rather through our language and the customs and cultures that, that come with that language. Uh, Sumi Prashant, what are your thoughts on, on that question? Um, you know, the, uh, the reality is majority, the vast majority of Tamils are of Hindu background, right? And of course you've got Christian, Catholic communities and Muslim as well. Um, is it, are we not tackling the whole issue by excluding the whole issue? Because the, the nature of religion and culture is that they're interlinked and intertwined. Uh, by, by not including religion in the conversation in, at the convention, are we missing out um, a part of the culture? Um, I don't 
I don't think so. I think a lot of the events themselves has some sort of, like if you look at it, Bharatanatyam is a, is a Hindu um, dance, right? Mm -hmm. It came out of the temples and so forth. So there are um, intertwining certain religious aspects in it, but I think what we're trying to say is that we don't want to alienate anyone, right? We want to, we want to be inclusive, and mm -hmm. that's what Fetna is about. And the commonalities uh, that, uh, that we have is, is our language and culture. Uh -huh. um, that's something that, you know, d despite which religion we all may come from, uh -huh. we, all ha we all share. Okay. So I think that's, that's the, the, the main point of Fatna. Uh, to, to add to that, uh, to what Sumi said, uh -huh. what we share is shared values. Uh -huh. uh, and a shared language, okay. and that, that transcends religion. I think religion being incorporated into organizations such as this that are aiming to be secular and non-political, it creates more barriers and more uh, divisions uh, do, you, do you feel it captures the full identity of Tamils though by not um, referencing that or including it? You know, the reality is like, you know, many of Tamil language, Tamil cultures is surrounded by the glorification of our ancient kings who, who were very successful, very great, and you know, uh, the reality is many of them had, pra all of them had, were Hindus and they had practiced religion, they had built great temples which forms much of our, our Tamil identity. So, I think that's still are being we missing out? I think that's still being discussed, oh. but it's not, it, if it's not, we're not trying to say, you know what, this, it's only a Hindu thing, oh. right? That's part of our history uh -huh. and we can't escape that, okay. right? Uh -huh. um, but that being said, it's, it's not the only thing now. Mm -hmm. And, and it, Fedna can't be everything, uh -huh. right? And okay. this is this is the focus of being a very secular, non-political. We're focused on uh, promoting the language and the culture uh -huh. and the co the community, the Tamil consciousness, uh -huh. as uh, Tangavela yeah, said, right? Uh -huh. um, and you know what? There are various organizations uh -huh. that are more focused on the religion or or the political parts. Uh -huh. And and Fetna need not be everything. Okay. Uh, right? uh part of the Fetna convention, we'll be looking at the legacy of Father. Um, Tani Arigal, and you know, he was a great proponent, proponent of the Tamil language, but he was also a Catholic priest, a, fa a Christian priest. So in that discussion, could we include uh, the various uh, religious aspects of Tamil identity? Well, uh, you know, I, I wanted to comment on uh, that actually, yeah. is that, you know, I think some of the, the greatest aspects of Tamil identity are, you know, some of the works of literature that we have, uh, Tirukural, uh, Silapadigaram uh, and uh, Tolkapiam. These are all, uh, you know, works of literature that are um, that are secular texts, and they are. Uh, well, like, Tirukkural uh, goes to much detail in the praise of God, not not in a through a specific religious lens, but yeah, certainly yeah. praises praises God and, and speaks to God. Sure, concept. it does, but it's important to remember that you know, as early Tamils uh, back in uh, you know in, back in southern India. Religion was really not so much established for uh, for our early Tamils. Uh, early Tamils would actually mostly worship nature and uh, things that they could see with their own eyes. Uh, the sun, um, farmlands, those kind of things are what we as Tamils have historically have historically worshipped. Only after that have a lot of major world religions come into it. Okay. I think you know Tamil culture is really based upon uh, not one specific religion, and I think even a discussion of uh, religion within, uh, you know, within uh, Tamil uh, culture, as far as our convention goes, is really um, not even so much needed. Right. I think we need to more focus upon uh, what unites us and what transcends religion, as the, you know, something that was just said. Okay. Uh, that's our, that's the language and the customs and cultures that come with that. Daguvela, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, many will argue that Saiva Siddhanta plays a, a great role in Tamil identity and Tamil culture. Uh, yeah. Is it, its absence at a Tamil convention notable? Uh, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, by nature, we say, you know, the Tamil people are secular. They are secular in outlook, you know. In, in theory, but in practice, are we really secular? Uh, if you if you read the Sangam literature, you know there was no uh, what he called organized religion at that uh, time, yeah. and uh, so our identity has continued to be on based on language and not religion. Yeah. 
Uh, it doesn't mean that you know we don't want religion or we. But then the dominant um, factor is the um, language. So it is around the language, you know, we people uh, get, uh, you know <laughs> get together. Okay. So introducing religion in a convention like this will create problems. Okay. Uh, because we had to give place to um, almost three religions, you know, Hinduism and Christianity, because there are, there are a number of people who are Christians, uh-huh. and also uh, the Muslims. Okay. So um, it, it is better, you know, even in politics, <laughs> we have kept the religion apart, you know. Okay. If, you, if you could go back to our um, history, political history, you know, the religion had played no part at all. Okay. Uh, Prashant, I'm curious to your thoughts. You know, many people say we're... Our, in our politics, where our l- language plays a role, but in practice and at home, religion plays a greater role. What are your thoughts on that? No, I, I think the way I view it is uh, what unites us. Uh-huh. It, whether you're a Tamil Muslim or a Tamil uh-huh. Christian or a Tamil Hindu, uh-huh. it's our values that unite us, and that's what I think Fetna is trying to uh, like elaborate and uh, and bring forth in uh-huh. this convention, not uh-huh. the not the different uh, religious aspects like Tangaveda I uh, just pointed out. Uh-huh. It's, we're more secular in our outlook. And uh, despite all that, what unites us is our values. And okay. even though religion plays an integral part in that, it's mm-hmm. not the determining factor. I okay. think it's, it's a combined factor, but it, our essence is more secular. Okay. And with that, unfortunately, our time is up for this segment. Uh, thank you, Sumi, Prashant, Vasant, and Tangaveda uh, yeah, okay. for coming on to discuss Uh, the FETNA convention and Tamil identity and culture and that conversation can keep going but we thank you for your time Uh, it's time for a short break Uh, dear viewers please join us after this short announcement Welcome back, dear viewers. At this year's FETNA convention, one of the keynote speakers is a young lady named Purnima Vidyashankar. Purnima was one of the founding engineers of Mint.com, a free online software that allows you to track all your financial accounts in one place. Mint.com was eventually sold for $187 million. Purnima has now founded BusyBee.com, a membership management software and billing solution. She also runs a popular engineering and entrepreneurship blog called femgeneer.com. Welcome, Purnima. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Sure. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so it's not uncommon in, our, you know, in the Tamil community for, for females, for young girls, to, to go into engineering and, and the sciences and the maths. However, it's, uh, you know, uh, I'm curious to your story. It's obvious that you have a strong passion for engineering, for the tech field, and for entrepreneurship. Uh, so how did your story come into to being? How did you come into your role? Sure. Uh-huh. Well, I, I'm sure many people have experienced this, but uh, my dad was an electrical engineer. Uh-huh. And when he was actually getting his master's at San Jose State, he would take me to the classes. And that was my first exposure. I was around three at the time, so I think I, that's when I saw my first circuit. And then throughout the course of my childhood, you know, he worked for some really big companies like Sony and Samsung and Texas Instruments, and I got to go and visit a number of the fabs there and see how all of the work was being done. But it fascinated me. Um, however, it's not what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to be a lawyer. Uh-huh. And so since the age of eight, all I was thinking about was law, even though my hobbies were computer programming, taking computers apart, you know, building things, playing with circuits. Uh-huh. And so it was this kind of funny, um, I don't know, experience. And when I got to college, I actually decided that I didn't want to become a lawyer. I got tired writing term papers and wanted to build something. Mm-hmm. And so I quickly switched majors from economics into computer science and then eventually added electrical engineering and was quite happy with my decision. But uh-huh. I, I realized ultimately that I enjoy building and that that's, what my, that's where my passions were. And that, and that building took you to uh, you know, a very successful startup, Mint.com. And within a few years, it went from, from, something, from nothing to, to something big. Uh, how was that experience and, and, and seeing that rapid pace of change from, you know, uh, what I'm assuming is a, is a you know, small group to uh, a, a, a large enterprise? 
Yeah, it was definitely quick in that I felt like I blinked and it was over. For me, I had been there for three and a half years, but I had known about Mint for more than four years. Uh -huh. And I, part of the rush was we were trying to be the market leader. Uh -huh. And we were also not necessarily the first ones out in the market in terms uh -huh. of a financial solution. Uh -huh. But we, know, we knew that we had to act quickly and that there would definitely be a lot of copycats coming out once they knew uh -huh. how we were uh, architecting the whole product. Right. And so part of our drive was to not only build a product quickly, mm -hmm. but to try to differentiate ourselves as much as possible. So we actually did a number of harder things than our competitors at the time. Uh -huh. But ultimately, uh, it was kind of a couple factors that led to the acquisition. So I think the uh -huh. first was there was a lot of great buzz around uh -huh. our product and especially not in the tech community, but also given that it was the height of the recession, right? So right. 2008 is when the recession came out, and so yeah. people became really budget conscious, uh, uh, and it was it was almost uh, like perfect timing. So there's that element of luck and timing in a way, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, uh, we knew that, that it could affect us in, in one of two ways. It could be positive in that uh, people want a product like this, but it could be negative in terms of trying mm -hmm. to get funding and um, trying to, you know, get um, people to come on board and, and uh -huh. work for us. You know, and so we were pretty fortunate. Uh -huh. in, in that discussion of you know, uh, tech startups, you know, people equated with the wild, wild west, right? Uh, how, and you, you, know, you mentioned the importance of being a leader in that field or to be the first one to get there. You know, there's a saying, the second mouse gets the cheese. Uh, does, does that, is that relevant to uh, in, in the entrepreneurial field or is it really the first one to get there? Is, is kind of the leader and, and reaps the success? You know, what I've noticed is it's almost never the first. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think the first is a great job of setting the pace uh -huh. in the market. Uh -huh. But ultimately, you know, if the second one comes around with a more innovative solution and is able to build a level of relevancy and interest in the market, then it's definitely going to, you know, outcompete. You can, you can take examples, I mean, Obviously, Mint is one example where there were already products in the market, and we uh -huh. certainly came later on. Uh -huh. But even looking at companies like Facebook, you know, yeah. MySpace was out before them. Exactly. Friend, yeah. Friendster as well. Uh -huh. uh, same thing with Google. You know, there were other companies doing search yeah. for many years prior to it. Uh -huh. So part of the value proposition, I think, that's very appealing to people mm -hmm. is simplicity. Uh -huh. And while they, while there might be alternatives out there, it's uh -huh. who can make the most simple solution and of course attract the masses that way. Exactly. Uh, I'm curious, you know, you, I'm assuming you probably had a very comfortable gig at Mint and you know, something secure. So why uh, the impetus to leave and start up BusyBee, your, your new venture? Well, I basically walked into uh, Intuit, which was our acquiring company, uh -huh. and I, I definitely went in with the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. But for me at the time, you know, I was 27 and they were telling me about my benefits package and uh -huh. uh, stock options. And I just thought, well, you know, how much money and how many benefits do, does somebody who's 27 need? And, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. and that uh -huh. I had had a great experience being a founding engineer, uh -huh. but to me, I always wanted to be in business and I always wanted to uh, learn about business. Uh -huh. And so the reason I left was because I wanted to transition from being an engineer to being an entrepreneur. Uh -huh. And I knew that that was my one chance. You know, I'd, I'd made some money from Mint and uh -huh. now I could spend, <laughs> spend it okay. um, basically building the next idea. So, so, tell, so. Us, tell us about BusyBee, how is it progressing? and the story behind it. Sure. So with BusyBee, I started off on uh, bootstrapping the company. Uh -huh. And the focus, of course, was on these membership-based businesses like Yoga Studios. Uh -huh. And we've gone very niche on purpose. Uh -huh. And you know, part of that is um, because of my domain expertise, but also in seeing this market rapidly growing over time. And so uh -huh. we want to participate, and we want to make sure that um, we, we capture uh, at least the loyalty of, of one group first before we move on to others. Mm -hmm. um, but however, because it's so niche focused, it has a much slower growth curve to something like Mint. Uh -huh. And so knowing that, 
you know, we're, we're at a stage now where we've spent the last two and a half years building the product uh -huh. and now we're transitioning more into customer acquisition and marketing. And right. so most of, uh, most of our focus now is back to bootstrapping, back to, you know, acquiring um, one studio at a time. Oh, um, gotcha. So it, it, it's a little bit slower of a, of a ramp up. Huh. But but truthfully, you know, um, it's the kind of business that I, I want to build. I you know was on a rocket ship once, and it, it uh -huh. can get really enticing to continue on that path. Uh -huh. But I wanted to try something different. I wanted to have a slower approach the second time around. Okay, gotcha. Um, uh, you know, a lot of my friends. I studied at the University of Waterloo. I did poli sci and math. But a lot of my friends did computer science and engineering. And right now, quite a few of them are are balancing a full time gig, a full-time job, on the side pursuing an entrepreneurial tech startup venture. Uh, what advice do you have for them in terms of balancing uh, you know, the, the, the pressures and demands of a full-time professional job with a tech startup on the side? And you, when do you make that transition to pursue that dream full-time? What, sure. what advice would you give to that? Sure. I actually have a lot of people that come to me with this, and uh -huh. um, it's actually something that I'm, I'm uh, grappling with myself right now. So uh -huh. while I do have Busy Bee as my tech startup, mm -hmm. uh, Femgineer is actually my second startup that brings in most of the capital since I am bootstrapping. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so the way that I think about it is you have to, um, no matter what, have a point in time where there's momentum, uh -huh. right? But, but up until that point, meaning maybe you have to spend some time saving up or maybe you get a round of funding or mm. something that then catapults your business. But up until you can make that decisive move, uh -huh. you are, are left with, okay, how do, I, how do I save? How do I build this product? Uh -huh. uh, and so part of it is being disciplined and taking the time to say, okay, I'm going to work on this on the mm. nights, on the weekends, uh -huh. and I'm going to do the, the parts that require my attention or my expertise. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then whatever doesn't, I'm going to delegate it. So uh -huh. a lot of times I encourage people that this is a golden opportunity to learn how to delegate better uh -huh. and to uh -huh. recruit people who can do the work for you, uh -huh. whether it's an intern, whether it's outsourcing development work, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. or whatever it is to get that initial prototype built. Gotcha. Um, but, but there's a number of things people can do, and I know they oftentimes feel you know, wedded to their full-time job, uh -huh. but if they can establish some level of routine and discipline, mm -hmm. then it might be a slower start. Once again, it might take a year or two uh -huh. or longer to get off the ground, uh -huh. but you have to have that consistency. Um, and, and then once you have either you know, secured enough savings or secured mm -hmm. around the funding, mm -hmm. then you can certainly switch over mm -hmm. um, or at least have some sort of support where uh -huh. you've got a spouse or someone else that mm -hmm. can support you as you're pursuing this dream. Uh, exactly right. Um, on, the, on that top, on that point of, you know, finding the right people, whether it's an intern or, you know, um, employees, I, you know, there, I came across a story where you had in your uh, a pitch had said you don't care what school uh, you went to or what degree you have, you're, you were more concerned about the attitude and what they were willing to do and, and their, uh, you know, the attitude towards the position. Uh, how did you come to that conclusion that, re I guess, if, if a conclusion that degree and choice of school doesn't matter, or to you at least? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I looked at a number of applicants, uh -huh. and what I was, was finding was that um, the ones who had the pedigree, um, uh -huh. to some extent, you know, had a really great pedigree. Oh, right. Uh, right. But the ones who almost, you know, struggled or were working full time or part time while going to school, uh -huh. or maybe had to put them through themselves through college and uh -huh. didn't necessarily um, go to the best college because of it, uh -huh. um, I found had a much more entrepreneurial spirit. Uh -huh. And so that's why I became a bit agnostic in terms of the schools that people came from. Gotcha. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't want people from you know <laughs> top schools, uh -huh. but uh -huh. I just noticed that uh, many of the applicants that I got, you know, uh -huh. they were okay with things like needing to adapt to change, uh -huh. you know, getting paid below market rate, uh -huh. um, and really being a part of the beginning of a venture mm -hmm. um, rather than coming in at the middle or towards the end where you need somebody that's more specialized or mm -hmm. is a risk averse. You, um, and so that's, that's really the reason. And, and do, you, do you think that, uh, that, that reality of the observation you made is, is part of 
that that dan that dynamic of you know if you, if you're in a way pampered in the sense that you know you've got the brain the na the brain the sorry the name brand schooling and the degree that it, with that comes a sense of privilege and entitlement which actually handicaps you in being su successful in the entrepreneurial world you know i i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily say that because okay. truthfully you know uh -huh. you have to dig one step below right so uh -huh. for example when i went to when i went to duke you know uh -huh. people would look at that and say well you know what is she talking about seems like uh -huh. she's pretty privileged right uh -huh. um, but the truth is i was on a combination of student loans uh, uh -huh. i i paid my way through school uh -huh. i worked a couple jobs and then my parents you know made up the rest okay. so uh -huh. really it doesn't i wouldn't say Pedigree doesn't matter, or going to a top school doesn't, you know, means that you're pampered. You uh -huh. have to dig into people's past a little bit more. Uh -huh. So you can't just look at the school and say, oh, mm -hmm. you know, well, this person's clearly going to be a qualified candidate or not a qualified candidate. Uh -huh. You have to understand why they decided to go to that school. Uh -huh. um, and even if they decided to go to maybe a public institution, you uh -huh. know, maybe they paid their way or they had a scholarship or something else like that. Uh -huh. So y you have to evaluate sort of the decisions of uh -huh. why someone chose that rather than just looking at the name. I okay. think too often people just look at the brand name and then immediately think that the candidate's going to be qualified. Uh -huh. um, but m my point is, it, they could be qualified, but you want to dig in to understand why they chose that school mm -hmm. and sort of what was the context. Gotcha. Uh, how important is it for you know, tech startups to be located in Silicon Valley? I know you're, you're, you're based in Palo Alto, California. How important is it to be, to be physically close to that hubbub of entrepreneurial activity? Yeah, you know, I used to think that it didn't matter at all. Uh -huh. And uh, as I've been going on my like Femgineer speaking tour this summer, uh -huh. I've noticed that it actually does matter. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it matters for a couple reasons. So I think the number one reason is fundraising. You know, okay. it's a lot easier and there's a lot more of a system set uh -huh. up for you uh -huh. in some in a place like Silicon Valley or uh -huh. New York City or Boston gotcha. where there are a number of business angels and VCs. Uh -huh. And that's a lot harder if you're not in one of those key towns. Uh -huh. But in terms of building an idea and getting it off the ground and building uh -huh. a product, uh -huh. you can pretty much do that you know, from anywhere. Exactly. Um, the key thing is to kind of keep a pulse on what's happening in some of these cities because definitely this is where um, you know, the ideas stem from. It doesn't mean that they don't stem from other places, but uh -huh. it's just in the, in the masses. Okay. So, so I'd say fundraising is sort of the key, but uh -huh. if, if you want to stay in your hometown and keep yeah. building your product, yeah. you know, you're certainly welcome to. And, and there have been a number of successful companies. And, and when, you, when you're seeking you know, angel investors or VCs, uh, how important is the in-person you know, uh, uh, pitch, sell? You know, I mean, you can, how, how significant is that difference between, say, like emailing, uh, you know, teleconferencing, video conferencing, and being in person? Yeah, it really depends on who you are. So okay. when I when I raised my round, my first round for Busy uh, Bee, uh, uh, any angel round, I actually did every uh, meeting, you know, on video. Okay. But I think part of the reason that people were okay with that uh, was given my background of having been at Mint exactly. and showing uh -huh. that I could build something. So I think for folks who don't necessarily have that track record, uh -huh. an in-person meeting is really important uh -huh. because part of what the um, investor wants to see is, of course, who you are as an entrepreneur and how you present yourself. Um, since in those in those early rounds, that's really what they're investing in. Uh -huh. And so I think you can obviously start the conversation you know, online, uh -huh. but in order to close a deal, you definitely want to do things offline. Okay. Um, if you don't, if you don't quite have the track record yet, uh -huh. and you know, uh, with you know, you're obviously busy with with Busy Bee. Uh, what are your? Do you have anything on the horizon that you know you're you're also managing Fem Fem Engineer, but anything else that that that's on your horizon you'd like to tackle or address? Well, I will be lecturing at Duke this semester, okay. so uh, in the fall I'm going to be moving there uh -huh. uh, to, to Durham, North Carolina, so I'll uh -huh. be teaching entrepreneurship at the engineering school. Uh -huh. And uh, in addition to that, yes, I'm growing Femgineer. Like I said, it's basically the, the business that's bootstrapping Busy Bee, uh -huh. and um, that's that's pretty much where I'm at right now, kind of juggling three things at once. Uh -huh. uh, I'm 
going to be doing more and more speaking. Huh. So I'm, I'm going to be at FETNA, but I'm huh. always looking for more opportunities because I think right now people, you know, want to hear war stories of uh -huh. entrepreneurs, um, uh -huh. but they also want to learn. So uh -huh. a lot of what I do is structured curriculum. We've got, a, we have a couple online courses coming up on mm. Femgineer uh -huh. that will help people who are either engineers or entrepreneurs and want to know how they can build a product and get a company off the ground. Uh -huh. And so I think it's, it's important to share some of my experience and my knowledge with those folks. Okay, great. And you know, just to end off our interview on a, on a softer note, uh, is you know I, I came across that you're you're a big yoga practitioner and advocate you know and, and many in, in the Tamil community you know uh, despite its you know obvious Hindu origins don't practice yoga or, or right. re and, and reap the benefits of it so wh why are you a big uh, yoga nut? Because uh, it basically lets uh, me do all the things that I want to do. I don't uh, think I would be as calm or sane uh, uh, or collected if I didn't uh, do the yoga uh, and I. I'd say I actually didn't learn about it uh, from any family members. Uh, I uh, um, learned about it from one of my good friends that I went mm, to undergrad with who right. um, had, had gone through some anxiety, had gone uh, through uh, some health issues. And uh, when I asked her, hey, what is what is it that has like, improved your life so much? Uh, you know, she told me it was yoga. And wow. so I was very uh, curious. And I've been practicing for about nine years. But okay. to me, that's um, that's really you know the place that I go to it, to relax and unwind and uh -huh. get get my energy back. Oh, so, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, generally we hear of the physical benefits, but there's I'm guessing there's a lot of uh, mental and uh, spiritual benefits in a way. Yeah, oh, definitely. Oh, okay. I think anytime I have a tough challenge with one of my businesses, getting on the mat and uh -huh. letting yourself enjoy uh -huh. yoga uh -huh. is, is the best way to kind of overcome some of that anxiety and those challenges. Okay, well, th this is a, a great interview. Unfortunately, we, that's, that's time for us. But thank you, Purnima, for, for taking time of your schedule for, and, and joining us. And we, of course, will be seeing you at FETNA in a couple of weeks. Great, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you too. Thank you, Purnima. Uh, dear um, um, TVI viewers, thank you for tuning in for another episode of Crossroads. Uh, have, a, have yourselves a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week.